Hey everyone, um, we're going to get started. I'm Jesse Grizzle. I'm a professor in the Department of Robotics. I used to have an appointment in electrical engineering and a partial appointment in mechanical engineering, and I erased all of that, and I transitioned over to here. Ryan and I uh, worked together, well, it was back in 2012 on something called a steering committee. And so Ryan was at the ground floor of um, laying the blueprints for what this department could become. We imagined a building, we imagined faculty hires, but we didn't imagine an undergraduate degree. We did not um, imagine really having eventually, Ryan, our faculty cap is supposed to be set at something like 35 eventually. Wow. So that's, that's just incredible. I mean, when we were serving on the steering committee together, we had almost all the roboticists on campus and we were six or seven mm -hmm. with you and Ed and Ella and Don and Ben and me. Uh, yeah. And um, Art Quo, remember him? Yeah, Art, I know. Yeah, so with that, I'm gonna let Ryan give an introduction to his background, but he was a, he was a professor at the University of Michigan for a long time. We really love to see how his professional career evolved, and we're hoping he'll come back and spend a semester or two with us uh, as his career evolves. So with that, Ryan, take it away. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, Jesse. Well, it's, yeah, no, I'm really happy to be able to kind of come back virtually right now um, and share with you a little bit. Uh, so I've definitely got my roots, you know, at U of M. And since about 2016, I've been on leave uh, at Toyota Research Institute. So. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is basically my personal journey, uh, how I got into robotics, um, and hopefully leave a lot of time for Q&A with you guys. But to kind of just start off the talk, you know, my personal philosophy toward my career has been follow serendipity, luck favors the prepared, and be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And uh, I will try to highlight that uh, through this talk uh, where that's happened. So uh, my own background is... Uh, I got my uh, undergrad at Michigan State, uh, mechanical engineering, uh, did a PhD in ocean engineering at MIT uh, slash uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. It's a joint program between the, the, the two. I did a postdoc uh, at Johns Hopkins, and I started as a faculty member at Michigan in 2006 in the Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering Department. Um, like Jesse, uh, you know, robotics is so interdisciplinary, so I ended up getting joint appointments with mechanical and electrical engineering at the time. Uh, this is before robotics existed. Um, and like Jesse said, I was part of this original uh, gang of six or seven of us that were trying to um, elevate robotics at Michigan and, and really turn it into this amazing thing that it's becoming. Um, because we had all this talent on campus, but we are so distributed across the different departments that you just never saw the 800 pound gorilla that Michigan is when it comes to robotics. Um, but now, you know, with this uh, becoming a department, having a graduate program, undergrad program, you know, we're really um, uh, moving full steam ahead uh, to be that 800 pound gorilla. Um, I was part of the design committee uh, for M City uh, back in the day. So this is a lot of work I was doing at the time with also Ed Olson. Uh, we were working on a lot of automated driving um, with Ford Motor Company at the time. Um, and how I got in automated driving was really uh, through a collaboration with Ford and being part of the DARPA Urban Challenge, where we were one of the finalists there. Uh, my research interests are in SLAM, uh, marine robotics, automated driving, so really kind of branched out into really robot perception, but also now motion planning, prediction, you know, the, the full kind of aspects of the autonomy stack. Um, and uh, it was in 2016 that I went on leave uh, from Michigan to help launch uh, the founding of the Toyota Research Institute. We started a lab here in Ann Arbor. Um, at the time, I had a 80 percent uh, appointment at, at uh, TRI and 20% at Michigan. And my running joke was that 80 plus 20 adds up to 150% of my time uh, trying to live in both those worlds. Um, I since then uh, uh, had, I now have a 5% 5 5 appointment with Michigan. Um, and uh, the reason I initially started off at TRI was to help lead or actually to lead the automated driving efforts uh, going on within Toyota here in North America. 
Um, we've gone through some organizational restructuring within Toyota where we have a new mobility company called uh, Woven Planet. So now if you go on Green Road, uh, what used to be the TRI office has now been rebranded as a Woven Planet uh, office. And this is where we're uh, consolidating all of our kind of mobility efforts within Toyota towards production settings. Um, I have continued to stay here at TRI more in the research forefront, you know, state of the art of what we're trying to push. And so now I'm leading actually three different divisions at TRI, um, our human centric AI uh, division, our human interactive driving team, as well as our technology adoption efforts all across TRI. Um, and so with that, let me talk about the first element of serendipity. Um, when I was finishing up uh, undergrad at Michigan State, you know, I recognized that I wanted to continue to go on and pursue uh, an advanced degree and have more control, I guess, over my scientific career and what I wanted to do. And at the time, I was really actually thought I wanted to go into aerospace. So all of the schools that I was researching at the time, whether it was like Caltech or um, Cornell, Georgia Tech, you know, even Michigan and um, uh, uh, MIT, it was when I was on the MIT website that I somehow stumbled across this joint program between MIT and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. For those of you guys who don't know about Woods Hole, um, they are located in Cape Cod, uh, about 80 miles south of, of MIT, and they're based at our national um, uh, deep submergence facility, so an oceanographic institution and kind of the world, one of the world leading ones. Um, and this is where um, a lot of our deep sea robotics capabilities uh, uh, come from um, in from Woods Hole. And so I stumbled across this web page uh, between uh, MIT and Woods Hole, and I saw like, you know, these autonomous underwater vehicles being deployed under the polar ice cap. And I was just like, what? You can do this? This looks like Discovery Channel sort of stuff, right? And so I was like, I'm in, right? Uh, I'm going to I'm gonna do that. And so I applied uh, and got into the PhD program there. Um, here you've seen, this is one of the robots that we built uh, in the research lab that I was part of. Uh, this vehicle is called Seabed. Um, and it has this uh, design on purpose of this kind of two hole configuration where basically you can think about all the heavy stuff like the batteries and um, our stuff in the in the that lower hull, whereas in the upper uh, yellow hull you see there, that's where the electronics and a lot of the um, buoyancy is uh, for the vehicle. So that it's basically it rides very stiff in the water and that's by design of what we wanted to do. So this is meant to be an imaging platform. So basically in that bottom hole, we have down looking cameras uh, sonars, uh, Doppler velocity logs for doing uh, dead reckoning navigation. And this vehicle was capable of diving to 2000 meters. Um, and we would use it many different places across the world um, from um, working with uh, biologists, marine uh, geologists, archeologists, really this was a, a science enabling technology. And that was the view that we brought um, from the robotic side. So if you look at the lower right, you can see a, a, a much younger version of Orion used us there. Uh, one of my superpowers is that, uh, touch wood, I don't get uh, motion sick. So I was the guy that could always kind of go into the belly of the ship and write code <laughs> for the vehicle uh, while the ship's rocking away. Um, so here's some examples of where we've used uh, this robot. Um, so this is in the Mediterranean, uh, looking for Greek and Roman shipwrecks. This is an amphora you see that was recovered there on the right. You can think of that as basically the 50 gallon oil drum uh, of the uh, Mediterranean world, uh, the ancient world. And this is what they would use to you know, ship lots of different kinds of goods and stuff. And so um, these are some of the archeological uh, uh, artifacts that we would recover. Uh, this was a really interesting one. So this is actually, I've been in the Arctic uh, up by the North Pole. Uh, that's a Swedish icebreaker that you can see there, the Odin. Um, and there we were deploying uh, a, a beefier version of that same kind of seabed vehicle design uh, where we had upgraded the vehicles to be 4,000 meters uh, rated um, and uh, we would deploy them below the ice sheet. And here we were looking for hydrothermal vent sites uh, up the Arctic region. And the reason, the reason those hydrothermal vent sites are scientifically interesting is that we find, you know, here on, on Earth, we find like, you know, photosynthesis where most, most life, right, is supported by sunlight in some way through conversion of energy into you know plants and then consumed by animals. Uh, when you get into the deepest parts of the ocean, there's obviously no sunlight down there. And so this is where you have chemosynthesis happening. So at these hydrothermal vent sites, you have very nutrient rich, super hot water. Um, and this is where you have life, new life forms that we discovered, I think it was like in the seventies is when we first discovered that these things exist uh, that rely on a very independent chemistry uh, than we find here uh, up on the surface of the earth. 
So uh, the type of problem that I worked on during my PhD was in uh, underwater navigation and mapping, basically really trying to deploy uh, simultaneous localization and mapping. Uh, underwater, we're GPS denied all the time. So we're so used today, you know, with our cell phones and Google Maps that, you know, we know where we are. But when you're trying to navigate underwater, uh, basically the radio waves that GPS relies upon, you know, water is opaque to those. Um, and so uh, navigating underwater, this is really one of those true uh, application domains for where you really need SLAM to work. And so in this case, we were using the camera imagery uh, that we were collecting anyways for the archaeology biologists, but also at the same time from an engineering perspective, how can we use this information to provide closed loop constraints and to help us localize the vehicle accurately um, and help it navigate? And so this has been a well-formulated problem at this point. Um, we have many kind of state-of-the-art methods to solve this. Uh, one of the, um, the more sufficient representations being this idea of what we call a pose graph, where basically you remember the robust trajectory as well as the observations of the landmarks. And it can be very efficient to kind of solve uh, in this form where you can take advantage of a lot of kind of sparse linear algebra techniques. And where my... Uh, uh, contribution came in was I, I recognized that it was through this kind of pose graph representation that if you marginalize all the landmarks, you could basically just keep a representation of the robot trajectory and you get these kind of off diagonal constraints that end up in this information matrix that is sparse and you can solve it efficiently. The reason I'm kind of telling you the story is this is the second aspect of serendipity, but also luck favors the prepared. Um, I, this was like probably my fourth year of my PhD. Uh, I was working in this area and I ended up breaking my right hand. So I could no longer write code and kind of work on what I wanted to do. So what did I do? Well, I'm left-handed, so this is how I can write. And uh, I started, I took at the time, uh, there was a very important seminal paper from Sebastian Theron uh, called Sparse Extended Information Filters. And I decided to derive every single equation uh, that was in there um, because it, he had made some approximations that allowed you to solve this problem efficiently. And it was through doing that that I gained this insight that um, instead of trying to marginalize those robot poses, uh, which is what uh, the sparse extended information filter was doing, and then trying to create approximations over the landmarks to keep it sparse, I, I found that when you formulated this problem and you keep the robot poses, it actually ends up being exactly sparse uh, in this information matrix, no approximation, and it allows you to then solve it uh, exactly and efficiently using kind of sparse linear algebra techniques. So that was an aspect of serendipity, I would say, in the sense of like, you know, I broke my hand and uh, uh, couldn't write code, but it also luck favors the prepared. I guess I've been working in this area and I was uh, able to uh, kind of go deep here uh, in terms of some of the science and really recognize this insight that was important at the time for us in terms of making an advance uh, in the SLAM community. And so what it led to uh, was, uh, well, what's whole, uh, in 2004, we, we uh, went back and resurveyed the Titanic. On uh, the, the upper left, you can see that's a, a photo mosaic uh, of you know, several hundreds of images kind of stitched together. You can see the remotely operated vehicle there, Hercules, that was used for this. And what you're seeing in the upper right, this is the downward looking imagery um, from the robot as it is basically doing a lawnmower-like pattern uh, over the wreck site and trying to give us full coverage. In the lower right corner, what you see is this basically this post graph representation. So this is a, a, a depiction of the robot's trajectory, but all the red links that you see, these are the cross registrations that are happening using a modern kind of computer vision techniques to associate you know, common landmarks that exist in overlapping imagery. We could insert those as constraints uh, into this um, uh, post graph uh, factor graph slam framework. And it allows us then to optimally kind of solve uh, for the robot poses given those constraints as well as the odometry. And so for this work, um, this is kind of part of my launching pad for my career because uh, it was really well recognized and I won a couple of best papers uh, for this. Um, and so what you see here is uh, when you, at the end of the day, you know, uh, we are able to reconstruct a robust trajectory. We can do a back projection to recover like a point cloud using stereo triangulation, which is what you see there in the upper left of kind of a, a 3D uh, topology map of the rack. Um, on the right is what you see is the reconstructed uh, trajectory uh, of the robot uh, with all the constraints. And what you see in the middle is actually that information matrix. So when I talked about it being a sparse uh, representation, what you can see is there's basically only about 0.5% elements that are non-zero uh, in this representation. So it was a very efficient way to computationally solve this SLAM problem, uh, leveraging sparse linear algebra techniques. 
And so uh, 2006, I came to Michigan, I joined the Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering Department. Um, this was also another element of, I guess, serendipity and some luck. Uh, I was graduating from MIT in my final year, and I, uh, and I was graduating from ocean engineering. And as you can imagine, there's not many ocean engineering departments uh, across the country. Um, Michigan has a naval architecture marine engineering department, which is focused more on ships, not robotics at the time. But I remember uh, calling up the department chair, Armin Trosh, uh, at the time and saying, hey, I, I don't fit any of the categories you guys are uh, searching for in terms of like hydrodynamicists or um, uh, uh, structural engineers or anything like that. Should I apply? And he's like, yeah, he really encouraged me because it was a new field for them to move into. And so normally when you do like a faculty search uh, or a faculty, I guess, trying to find a job, you would send applications out to many, many places. Uh, in this case, uh, I, I sent one uh, to Michigan. I uh, thought it would be a good opportunity just to go through the motions and practice things. So I was totally surprised when I got called in and made the short list and came and gave the talk. And then they offered me the job, which I was not expecting at all. Uh, so that's that's actually why I did a postdoc at Johns Hopkins. I was like, I just feel way too young to start as a faculty member right now. I need a little bit more experience. So I was able to negotiate with Michigan to do one year postdoc at Johns Hopkins and then kind of start. And so I just founded the Perceptual Robotics Lab uh, in Michigan. Um, so we worked really in the problem space of robot perception, uh, navigation mapping, uh, SLAM, um, and uh, both in the underwater domains so on the upper left are some of the robots uh, that we had uh, in the lab. But we also, uh, you know, we had like the segue that you can see there in the lower left. We were doing some problems like long-term autonomy and really thinking about how do you build map representations over years. And so we'd use this robot on North Campus uh, to collect those type of data sets that we could use to support that research. Um, and this is uh, serendipity number three for me, how I got into uh, automated driving. So when I joined uh, the department, and this was uh, July 2006, uh, Jing Sung who's one of the faculty uh, in Naval. She had actually been at Ford Research and had joined maybe one or two years prior to me to the department. And at the time, Ford was putting together a team to enter in the 2007 DARPA Urban Challenge. Uh, this is when uh, the Velodyne HDL64, which is one of these kind of 3D spinning LIDARs, uh, was a brand new sort of sensing paradigm at the time. Uh, came about, Ford was getting like unit number one of those things. And they're like, we don't know what to do with this thing. Is there anybody Jing on campus that you can think could work with us? And so she connected me with them and uh, that led into the, over a decade then of working with Ford. So we uh, we had this basically Ford F-250 that was made to be autonomous. Um, you can see the uh, sensing rig and stuff up on the, on the roof in the back of that truck. If you can imagine it, there was like a whole cluster of computers back there, basically a server farm. Um, and uh, yeah, we ended up being one of the finalists uh, in the DARPA Urban Challenge, as you can see there. And so uh, the kind of problem domains I ended up working on uh, at Michigan range from uh, marine robotics with underwater visual SLAM. Uh, some of the work in my group was in cooperative navigation, think the things of like using like acoustic modems to have low bit rate communication between the robots and how could you use that information effectively uh, as a network uh, to help improve localization long-term autonomy I mentioned, and then automated driving. I just want to touch upon two of them here. So the underwater visual slam and automated driving. So some of the work I continued at Michigan was in uh, using underwater visual slam, in this case, working with the Office of Naval Research in the Navy to do autonomous uh, ship hull inspection. So this is a robot in the, in the right depiction that you can see made by a company in Boston called Bluefin Robotics. Um, and it was a spin out actually from some efforts at MIT. Um, and so this robot uh, is uh, equipped with cameras, it's equipped uh, with sonar, um, and also has something called a Doppler velocity log, which using the Doppler shift principle allows you to basically measure relative uh, velocity of the vehicle relative to, to the structure, in this case being the hull. And so we, the goal here was to be able to deploy the robot and have it to be able to map, you know, and cover 100% of the bottom portion of the ship hull. Importantly, you know, applications of this are for like explosive ordnance uh, detection. So we're trying to um, not put humans in harm's way. Normally, this task is done with divers today, and so we're trying to automate it with robots uh, to de-risk the, the 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 risk, I guess, to humans in doing this task. And so here's a depiction of, of kind of what you would see is that you know the robot gets deployed. Um, you're seeing a visualization of the field of view of the camera in red and the field of view of the sonar in blue. 
And so as the vehicle is navigating and trying to traverse across the bottom of the, of the hull, you see the blue kind of being the odometry representation of where the robot is. These red links that you see, these are the constraints that are coming from camera and sonar as we're matching overlapping imagery and the features in them. And you can see as we add these constraints to the graph, how the whole graph is shifted and optimized to account for those constraints um, and give you an estimate that is much more close to the actual ground truth of the trajectory that the robot um, swam. Um, and then in the automated driving realm, so you know, my launching pad was working with Ford in the 2007 Dark Urban Challenge, and that then led to over a decade of working with Ford. So up all the way until 2016, uh, I had worked with Ford on their automated driving efforts with Ed Olson. In particular, in 2012, I think when Ford decided to go much bigger uh, and they launched what it was called the Next Generation Vehicle Project. So at the time at Michigan, I think this was the largest industry-sponsored project that Ed and I had uh, at the university. Um, and so there, you know, we were working on all facets of, of the autonomy stack with Ford. Um, from the mapping and localization, which you see in the upper left there, right? This is a map that we produce in downtown and you know, drive the car through the environment. We've got four LIDARs on it. We could slam optimize that, build these maps, and then we would be able to localize into them um, and then do the, all the prediction uh, and motion planning associated with that. One of the results I highlight that we did for my research group here was, you know, building these maps and using LIDAR at the time fairly expensive. We asked the question, what happens if I had a LiDAR map, but I wanted to localize using low cost cameras, would that be possible? Uh, so this was uh, some work with one of my students, Brian Wolcott, where uh, basically you're seeing a forward looking kind of view uh, coming from the, uh, the vehicle optical camera. On the right, this is a LiDAR map that was produced. And importantly, in the LiDAR, you not only get geometry, but you get surface reflectivity signal back. And so if we look at the ground plane, we see that we can actually pick up the road paint uh, that's there as well as you know streaks from like tar in the road and things like that. So it becomes an observable signal. And so what the, the idea we had here is like, well, if we have this map and if we have an idea of where we are in the map, we should be able to back project what we would expect to see from our point of view, right? And so we see on the right is a synthetic view coming from where we think we are in the map derived from LIDAR. On the left is what we see then uh, observationally from our uh, optical camera, and now we're going to use a normalized mutual information score to basically allow us to overlay uh, and do the matching association with that. So in this video, you're going to you'll see basically how we approach this as this kind of a search and configuration space of X, Y, you know, for the robot pose as well as uh, yaw uh, orientation. So here we're just showing you what some of the perturbations look like in this configuration space. And here we're exploiting the fact uh, of uh, using image warps to account for the yaw. And so now what you're seeing here is actually an overlay of the optical camera imagery on top of the LiDAR imagery. And what you can notice is just how accurately aligned they are, which shows you the level of um, resolution that we're able to obtain in terms of the robot's pose uh, and be able to localize it, you know, to kind of five centimeter level precision at any given time. But again, just using a low cost camera sensor predicated on the fact we already had a high definition uh, reflective kind of LiDAR map for this. So this leads then to uh, the, I guess, one of the last elements of serendipity that I'll talk about. Um, it was in 2000. So I had a great thing going on uh, at Michigan. Uh, uh, part of you know launching the robotics institute with Jesse, having a lot of fun uh, working with Ford, and all of a sudden uh, Toyota decided to launch uh, this Toyota Research Institute, which at the time seemed like a very big number, like this billion dollar you know mandate uh, and funding level. And uh, so Gil Pratt, uh, who uh, comes from um, having run many of programs at DARPA on the like the DARPA Robotics Challenge, was picked to be the CEO and kind of founder of this. Gil reached out into his network uh, and began to recruit people. And um, it was through some of those connections that I got the call from Gil. And uh, I had to take faith. Um, it was a very agonizing decision for me, uh, I guess, to make this trade off of like, should I go or should I not? Uh, but at the end of the day, I decided to walk through that door and to take that chance because I saw the opportunity to work with a great kind of really smart collection of people uh, coming to together, really, really uh, sourced um, to do this um, at scale. 
And so I uh, went uh, to TRI in 2016 with Ed. So a few quick facts about TRI. Uh, it, we were launched in 2016. The divisions that we had at the time were automated driving, robotics, advanced material design yes. and discovery, as well as machine assisted cognition. The key theme within TRI is to think about how we use AI to amplify humans, not replace humans. So in all these different facets of the different applications of robotics, um, we're looking to augment humans by trying to use uh, robotics, whether it's in AI kind of cognitive assistance with the machine assisted cognition team, or if it's the case of automated driving, our approach was a little bit different than everybody else. And let me tell you a bit more about what that was. Um, here you can see the, the team. This was a circa 2018. This is in the garage at the TRI facility in Ann Arbor. Um, and we went through an evolution of platforms uh, to you know, kind of rapid evolution many generations going from the sci-fi looking ones on the left, right, to the two on the right that look much more integrated uh, in terms of the sensing, actually working with the Lexus design team to create this very kind of stylized integrated look for the vehicle. Uh, one of the things we did to support our automated driving efforts, actually in Michigan, we built our own test, test track. So, you know, we had M-City, we have like ACM, American Center for Mobility, um, but to support the daily grind of engineering and development, we actually built our own test track site down in Ottawa, Lake Michigan, basically right on the border uh, of Ohio on 23 South, um, where we have a large kind of oval configuration where you have the highway speeds, but in the center of that, we have this basically asphalt pad uh, where we can put down like shipping containers and things like that to kind of be give you sight line occlusions that are important for like LIDAR and camera obstruction um, and allows us to do the daily grind of kind of testing and development. So what the problem I was really focused on and um, thinking about automated driving, what kept me up at night is really thinking about these numbers. You know, in the U.S., we talk about 42,000 vehicle fatalities annually. It's hard to digest what that number means, but to put in perspective, that's like one Boeing 757 200 falling out of the sky about every two days. Uh, and we think about it like that, you're like, wow, if we had an airplane crash in every two days. I don't think from an engineering standpoint, we would let that stand. Um, and when you look at it globally across the world, it's over a million and a quarter fatalities. And to put that in perspective, that's like 18 757s falling out of the sky every single day. That's a big number. Um, so we really, you know, while a lot of the industry was focused on full automation, typically thinking about, you know, robo taxis like rideshare or maybe automated long haul trucking package delivery. At TRI, we were really focused on how can we use this technology to save as many lives as possible as soon as possible, which informed actually for us a different take and strategy than a lot of the other um, efforts out there in automated driving. So our concept is, is this idea of one system, two modes. Like everybody else, we're trying to build a fully automated driving capable vehicle, which is considered like SDE level fours or level five a sort of capability. We call that chauffeur. So basically chauffeur is when the system is fully autonomous and the humans are strictly a passenger uh, in the vehicle. There's no driving responsibility on them. You're starting to see, you know, small deployments like this, you know, like Cruz and SF, uh, San Francisco now is starting to kind of launch some of these services. You'll start to see this, I think, in fair weather regions and urban environments, but it's going to be a long road before we see ubiquitous adoption of this, especially if it, we're talking about driving in the Northeast, you know, in snow covered road conditions. So at the same time, we thought about, well, can we use this a full autonomy stack? What would it mean to partner with a human and to think about what we call guardian? Fundamentally, it comes down to three things. Don't leave the road. Don't hit things. Don't get hit. How do we use a full autonomy stack to keep the human in the loop, not out of the loop, to make you superhuman as a driver, to basically really tackle um, the safety first aspect and save as many lives as possible. And so the idea is really to build a core autonomy stack and wanted to deploy it first in an active safety sort of mindset. So really this convergence of active safety with automated driving and ultimately it leads to a, a chauffeur capability that we can deploy at scale. So we were, had a much longer view sort of game plan of how we're approaching this. Uh, here you can see, um, so we have actually some of our fleet is driving in Japan, uh, in Tokyo. This is the Odaiba district. Um, we were supposed to have a very public uh, showing in 2020 at the Tokyo Olympics and COVID put a squash to that. Um, but anyways, this is some of the efforts that um, of our vehicles driving uh, in a pretty busy district environment there in, in Tokyo, uh, dealing with you know lots of heavy trucks and traffic. So I'm showing this just to show you that this is a full autonomy stack. You know we can do the L level four humans as a passenger sort of thing. 
But at the same time, we're pursuing, how do we use that same stack to think about Guardian? What does it mean to keep the human in the loop? And so let me walk you through this. So in the upper left, um, you know, we're really inspired by modern fighter jet and this idea of envelope control. So the F-16 was one of the first uh, aircraft that was designed on purpose to be dynamically unstable. And the reason it was designed to be dynamically unstable is it makes it highly maneuverable. But it also means that the pilot actually not put enough control input fast enough to actually keep the plane stable. So the idea of this kind of control framework is that when the human is actually giving commands through the stick, that's actually being interpreted in terms of the human's intent. And then there's a low level flight control system that is then keeping the vehicle dynamically stable while also obeying them what the pilot's intent is of where they want to go. We had the same idea of like, how do we take that but bring it down to the ground plane, um, which is a much, much harder task uh, because now, you know, if you're flying in air, there's, it's a relatively, you know, open space sort of environment. If you're gonna do this on the ground plane, we have to understand the road topology. We have to understand the other agents in the environment, whether it's other drivers and pedestrians, it becomes a much more complicated framework. But here you can see a depiction in the lower left. Um, this is basically a visualization of that uh, envelope. And in this case, you know, where we line the course with these cones, uh, the car sensing them actively, kind of computing the, the safe region of space. We're asking the driver to try to escape uh, from that safe region. And basically the car is blending the control input of the autonomy stack with what the human wants to do to keep the vehicle safe. Uh, to support this development, one of the enabling things is this idea of steer by wire so that through steer by wire and software we can be dynamically changing the coupling between the driver's input and through the steering wheel and what the actual yaw angles are doing uh, from the front tires of the vehicle. In the upper right then is an example of using this from a safety application. We call this a, a pop-out event. This is like a, a blind driveway, somebody coming out. In this case, uh, the human can't react fast enough and the car is able to automatically do a lateral change while also avoiding other objects in the environment uh, to avoid that crash. And important, this is where the steer by wire comes in because when the vehicle makes that sort of lateral motion, you don't wanna rip the steering wheel out of somebody's hands. And so this is where it's important to be able to dynamically change that coupling uh, between the steering wheel angle and what the car's actuation actually is. But in terms of, so we're using this from a safety standpoint, but I, I also, you know, I talked about amplifying people. This is a really cool one. So look at the lower right. Uh, we set up this basically um, slalom course where if you try to drive it as a human, you just, you can't do it. You end up hitting cones um, and you can't make it through clean. We then turn Guardian on and we say, hit the gas and go as fast as you can. And you're able to seamlessly drive the course perfectly where the car is giving you just enough assistance uh, to make you kind of superhuman and be able to drive through that thing. And so really amplifying the joy of driving. And actually now this is uh, one of the, Current projects uh, that my uh, in my human interactive driving division that I oversee, uh, where we're now we're work, working on the edges of what does it mean to have controllability at extreme vehicle dynamics. And so, if some of you may have seen some of the videos from our Super Drift project. Before I play the video, let me set the stage for this. The kind of phase portrait plot that you're seeing here on the right. Um, that little green box that you see in the center, this represents the stable, uh, basically the stable re regime in this phase space uh, portrait here, where this is where today's ADAS systems uh, operate. They only operate in a regime of stability, assuming we're not going to have any type of tire slip. If you look, though, at like the, um, uh, the red and the kind of purple uh, delineated regions here, you can see they're much, much bigger, right, than that little kind of green uh, space. And this is where like professional drivers that are able to do drift driving can drive. They can actually exploit all the dynamics of the vehicle and can and have controllability in a much, much larger regime. We're trying to do the same thing now from an automation standpoint. So this is why we're looking at drift as a proxy problem for us of like, how do we have controllability under slip conditions? It's a very cool kind of sexy proxy problem to work on, but you know, the intent and application of this is how will I enable this technology, say in a Toyota Corolla, that when you hit a patch of ice, you basically have a professional driver under the hood with you all the time and will help you recover from that. So with that, let me play this video.
so uh, we have, this is actually a, a little bit older video. We have uh, uh, some more newer results where we show this basically using it to avoid obstacles and they have to like swerve and be around them. Um, but really we're thinking about how do we use this technology from an enabling standpoint when it comes to active safety sort of systems. So with that, uh, that gives you hopefully a synopsis of kind of my career journey, how I got into robotics, um, and really some of the if you if you really pursue this area, just how many rich, really cool problems there are to work on. I think in the field of robotics, that um, yeah, I, honestly uh, for me, I don't feel like I go to work every day. I get to go to play every day, um, and so that's I think that's the best thing when you're that becomes your career uh, is when you find that sort of alignment. Um, and so again, my advice, my personal advice has always been, you know, follow serendipity. I tried to hopefully point out to you some of the doors I, I chose to walk through that were always gambles. But for me, I, I've always chosen to take the risk, I guess. Uh, luck favors the prepared. So, you know, when serendipity happens, it's those that are prepared are the ones that are ready to uh, take advantage of it. Uh, and also to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. You know, in all these steps that I've, I've gone through in my career, I've never felt prepared. Um, but it's through willing to be uncomfortable and to learn, right, and to grow, I guess, is how uh, I think has been an important element uh, of uh, some of what I've been able to achieve in my career. And so with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank <laughs> Professor Yusuf. <laughs> Ryan, that was just amazing. And, you know, I think... When I was a young student, and maybe you when you were a young student, you thought you went to school to learn what you were actually going to be doing throughout your entire career. And right. you just blew that away, okay? What you're doing now, you didn't do anything. And well, you were you had the foundation. So what we're what you're gonna get here are the foundation so that you can evolve. And what a what an amazing story and we miss you here at Michigan, but we're super proud of what you're doing there.